there any questions for Neil? Any comments? Terry has a comment. Oh, yeah, we got. Oh, what did I say? 15 pounds? Sorry. Oh, maybe oh. the whole, is the whole head 15 pounds? Okay, so I got the wrong number. <laughs> so your head is 15 pounds, your brain is 3 pounds. Thanks for that correction. So that's brain minus blood, I guess. Yeah. Any other comments? Um, I think uh, Terry had some remarks. So um, I want to pick up, actually, because this is something that actually uh, I had a similar experience when I was uh, at the National Radio Astronomy Observatory uh, in my senior year in um, college, and uh, saw the Palomar Sky Atlas, which uh, was a deep, one of the early deep space atlases. It was actually taken uh, at the uh, Palomar uh, Observatory, which is just a few miles away from here, by the way. Uh, and it was a similar feeling of, of being uh, part of a much, much larger and much vaster um, sort of um, arena than I could have ever imagined, just seeing that physical evidence. But there's something else that is also, I think, equally important, and that is that when you make a discovery in astronomy, that uh, you see a supernova that's never been seen before, or analyze a, a, a rock from the moon that's never been analyzed before, it's humanity doing that for the very first time. Before that, nobody knew what was in the moon rock. And after that, it's in the textbooks. And you can only live through that moment once. Uh, and I had the same feeling when I saw the picture from the back of Saturn, occluding the sun. That's an image that will go down in history. Before that picture was taken, when Carolyn Porco showed it, uh, she obviously had been I've, sitting I've on got, it for I've quite a while. It. I've got it. Uh, when, you know, when that, was, when that was done, this is humanity for the very first time putting itself through our technological capability uh, into a position where we could see things that no human, or as far as we know, no other living being has ever been before. So that, that's a very special moment. And we're living through those moments on a daily basis not just in astronomy, but in biology. It's within our lifetime that we have sequenced the human genome. I once asked Francis Crick if, when they first published that paper on uh, the structure of DNA with uh, Jim Watson, whether it occurred to him that within his lifetime, the structure of DNA, not just the structure of DNA, but the sequence, the base sequence, of DNA would actually be worked out. And he said that it never even occurred to him to ask that question. It was inconceivable because the technology at the time was so far be uh, 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 so, so inefficient and so far behind what we have now that it, you, you could calculate it be the lifetime of the universe. But it's not just the human genome because now we're systematically sequencing all the genomes, and it's going to get faster. And the reason is that, as with computers that are getting exponentially faster and cheaper, the cost of sequencing genomes is getting exponentially faster and cheaper. And they estimate that within our lifetime, it will be possible to sequence your genome for $1,000. But it's not just human genomes that we're interested in. We're interested in the whole genome of all creatures that live on the earth. And why are we interested in that? Well, we're interested because therein is the history of evolution. And the chimp sequence was, for example, worked out just a few years ago. And that was particularly interesting because it is our closest living relative, and it only differs in its DNA by a few percent. Now, that's a small percent, but it actually translates into millions of base pairs, so there's a lot of differences there. And there's a problem, because if you see a difference, how do you know whether it is a difference on the line descending to humans or a difference on the way to chimps? Well, it turns out there is a way to figure that out. And uh, I learned it 
at a symposium that was held right here in this auditorium last Friday. It was sponsored by the La Jolla Group on the Origin of Humans, and it was a symposium on Neanderthals. So humans and Neanderthals coexisted for uh, hundreds of thousands of years, and in fact, up until recently, uh, we're, uh, in, in, we were living in Europe uh, together with them, I, I presume peacefully, maybe not. But <clears throat> what I learned at the symposium was that an effort is now underway by Savante Pabo to sequence the Neanderthal genome. How could that be? Well, there are bones, and these bones have DNA. They're degraded with time. But even more, making it even more difficult, they're contaminated with human DNA. But it is possible, if you look carefully, to find pieces of bone that have been discarded because it wasn't realized that they were Neanderthal bone. And so no humans touched them or washed them or looked at them. And it turns out that from these samples, you can get fairly good short sequences. And so the effort is now underway to collect enough of these short sequences to completely cover the genome. And so we will know within the next three years the differences between our genome and a species that is extinct. We're going to resurrect an extinct genome. And that will allow us to disambiguate which line the changes occurred on, because our line uh, branched off from the Neanderthals, for example, uh, much, uh, much more recently than that for the chimp. This is all happening during our lifetime. We're going to know the genomes of hundreds of thousands of species. We're going to be able to read the differences and translate that into ultimately an understanding of how it was that we got here. And finally, I think what's, what's missing and actually part of the roller coaster of this last few days for me has been the realization of really how little we know about ourselves and how much disagreement there is, even uh, when we do our best, how much um, ignorance there is and how much humility we need to have in order to be able to make progress. But I think this is a good sign. I think that we have here the opportunity as human beings for the first time. Uh, we have tools and techniques that uh, technology and science has given us. We have ways using brain imaging to study the, uh, the brains not just of monkeys and cats and rats, but also our own brains functional magnetic resonance imaging, and it's going to get better. Those techniques are just the first steps we're taking. And ultimately, I think, will give us a much, much better picture and will be able to help inform us on making some of the decisions that are going to be made. And I think that, uh, speaking now as a former physicist, uh, I'm just gonna put out a hypothesis about where we are right now. Uh, <clears throat> so, it's all about scaling. How do you scale up from a family to a tribe, from a tribe to a group, a nation, and a nation to a world? Well, if communication is slow, you know, if you have to go by the word of mouth, you can only, it, it really limits the size of the group that you can actually organize, that you could lead. But that's all changed within the last, again, within our lifetime, communications has made it possible for information to be instantly transmitted across the entire globe. We're basically going through another one of these scaling transitions. Uh, nations was a natural unit when you had limited communication with uh, horses and then trains. But you know, uh, we have the internet now. And I think that is gonna have a profound influence on how we organize ourselves. Um, maybe this turmoil is something we've gotta go through as a species to get to a more global form of organization. I don't know how we're going to get there or whether we're going to get there, but in any case, I think that this is a special moment in history. And so finally, I just want to say that uh, coming from a background really which didn't really uh, have a lot of time to think about these issues, it's really filled me with lots of interesting issues and ideas that I think uh, are going to require much, much more thought, effort, uh, analysis to actually be able to uh, figure out how we're gonna do this integration, but I really f feel it's important that we do it. And th the single person I think that we have to thank for this, who's really had this, this uh, meeting uh, 
percolating for, for a long, long time, and who, in a sense, uh, managed to do something that I consider almost impossible, which is to get up people on the stage and be able to have a, a, a discussion and bring out those dif differences. Um, you know, before this meeting, people would come up to me and say, what's the schedule? What's the schedule? I want to know who's talking when. Well, there wasn't a schedule, and that was on purpose. And it was the reason was that the meeting actually unfolded in real time. It was organized in real time. We didn't know what was going to happen in the afternoon because the morning hadn't happened yet. And I think this is a much more uh, organic way of, of searching an area of, of unknown and disagreement than uh, a, a traditional scientific meeting where everything is hammered into place before the meeting. It has uh, been for me, uh, a real roller coaster in terms of uh, people and ideas. It's been, uh, it's, it's been an absolute uh, feast. And it's not just uh, the people here in the auditorium, I think, who are going to benefit from it, but all of those who will have access to it on the internet, the internet, which was vastly uh, magnify, I hope, the impact of some of the things that we've heard here today. So let's first of all thank Roger for being an absolutely magnificent organizer and also is, is Ron Zepps here to the Zepps family who actually very generously could you stand up please very generously provided the resources without which we wouldn't have been able to have such a really great program so Roger do you want to finish up with the Oh, just a couple of comments. Yes, thank you very much for that. Obviously, thanks also to the uh, Katie and uh, Sherry and Riley's not here, and to Linda. Thanks to the crews, thanks to the speakers. There were actually, we ended up with 29 speakers in total. Uh, some people spoke more than once. And there's that wonderful photograph that Neil was talking about. Wonderful image. Um, do you actually want to just say a bit more about that? Oh, um, I wanted to, uh, in, in 30 seconds, I just want to alert you. How many? That 30, I promise. Uh, <laughs> I swear it's 30. Um, I teach a program back in New York once a month, third Tuesday of the month, called This Just In. And I spend one hour reviewing the previous 30 days of cosmic discovery as revealed through press releases in those 30 days or through stories that are not yet made into press release but I otherwise had access to. And um, among them are just, uh, I just went to that presentation, I pulled it up because that's where I presented that image of Saturn that Carolyn shared with you. But I just want to show you just a couple of things that have happened in the last 30 days. There's a transit of, can we dim the lights again please? Of the, the, the International Space Station across the surface of the sun. And it's right there. And this is the space shuttle catching up with the space station in orbit around Earth. And you can zoom in a little closer to that and you can see. And the space shuttle comes in backwards up to it because it opens in the payload bay right there. And so you have to be in the right place at the right time to capture this, by the way. This was September 21st. This is the space station transiting across the surface of the moon. And these are single frames of a, of a, uh, of a, a movie uh, camera. And um, this is the imaging of the famous face on Mars. We just got new images released by the Mars orbiter. And remember the face on Mars, this is a close-up of it. And it is, in this picture, it's right there. And we have a much higher resolution of what's going on. You can kind of make out the face. It's a face, it's a face. yeah. It's a oh. face if you are a vertebrate, okay? <laughs> if, <laughs> if, if you're a jellyfish, this would not be noticeable to you. Something else would look like your own species. If you're a jellyfish, I have to watch out for that. What do you say the brain was associative? Um, let's skip that. Oh, actually, we, Hubble just discovered 16 new planets. Uh, that's right there. Objects in orbit around their host star. Uh, they're on stars in the centers of these circles. And this was the beautiful image of Saturn. Saturn's, uh, the sun is on the other side. You see a little bit of it glistening through the outer atmosphere of Saturn. And that dot is the Earth seen through Saturn's rings. Earth won't venture far from the sun. The sun is behind Saturn right now. And so you're not, Earth goes around the sun like that. 
You're not going to find it way out here. And so there's the Earth. And you have other specks. Some are stars, and others are just simply moons of Saturn. And we get in close to it, and then you can see it there, the, how distant and frail we are. And this is the zone that was spewed forth by plumes that came from Saturn's moon and Enceladus. And the, the rings are very complicated, but in a fun, interesting, and challenging way. Uh, not in any kind of impossible way, and these are just an artist's vision of what the particles look like. And one last reflection on that image. So we get this monthly. This is, this is just the past 30 days. And so this feeling in our heads is there all the time, and I don't hold that feeling uniquely. All my colleagues feel it as well, uh, as surely did Carolyn Porco. So I want to thank you again for this conference. <laughs> Um, just one thanks also to the Crick Jacobs Center, particularly Terry for his, his enormous support and back, backing here as well. The, um, I, I won't say much more. The inside the back cover of the programs you have is the Anselm Kiefer painting that I was talking about, which is this. Um, it, you can see that the universe from these paintings and uh, uh, images and from here is plainly a, a big operation. We've got a long way to go to understand what's going on. And the universe in here is a big operation as well. It's going to take a long time before we understand that as well. I'm reminded of one, one line from William James in the Varieties of Religious Experience, uh, in which he was talking about his nitrous oxide experiences. And he said uh, that we should beware of a premature closing of accounts with reality. So we're not closing our accounts with this subject. The conversation will continue. And we already have set some dates aside. Next year, the Society for Neuroscience meets here in San Diego um, from, San, uh, from the 3rd to the 7th of November. So we are having um, Beyond Belief 2 here, same place, November the 1st to 3rd, 2007. And I hope you'll come back. Thank you.